Welcome to this worship experience that caps off a week of engagement before our hybrid Synod Assembly business meeting tomorrow, Saturday, May 14th. As the whole Synod, we have participated in pre-assembly workshops this week. If you knew nothing about these workshops, please sign up for eNotes on our Synod website so you too can be in the loop with Synod news and opportunities. Tomorrow, voting members will go to one of eight host sites to meet in person, and we will be connected through the wonders of technology. The whole proceedings will be available through a live stream link on our website. And now I'd like to turn our attention to this worship service. It is a service of the word as Christ comes to us and the scriptures read and the word proclaimed. We will be lifting up what various biblical authors have to say about faith and singing our affirmation of their witness in our hymns. In this video, pastors from all over our synod will lead the worship. I invite you to light a candle and take a moment to prepare your heart and mind to worship the one who is the source of our faith, the beginning and the end, our refuge and strength, the author of life, the God who is most clearly revealed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hello, my name is Pastor Keith Colstead, and I am newly retired uh, this year after 37 years of ordained ministry. Please join me as we give thanks for the gift of baptism. Water, water. We praise you, O oh God, for water, for the mighty Lake Superior, for beautiful Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron, and the Portage Canal, for the Menominee River, and the many lakes and streams of northern Wisconsin. We praise you, O oh God for the snow and the rain that nourishes animals and plants, the water for drinking and bathing. We praise you, O oh God, for water. We praise you, O oh God, for water. We praise you, O oh God, for our water stories, a flood that cleansed the earth, the sea that drowned the enemy, a river that healed leprosy. We praise you, O oh God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. We remember the waters of Jesus, baptized in the Jordan River, calming the Sea of Galilee, drinking from Jacob's well, healing at the pool of Bethesda, washing the disciples' feet. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O oh God, for the waters of baptism. For through this water, you birth us into the family of Christ, bathe us in forgiveness, and enliven us in the Spirit. We praise you, O oh God, for baptism. We praise you, O oh God, for baptism. O oh God, you are the ocean sustaining this earth. O oh God, you are the river saving us from death. O oh God, you are the fountain granting us health and well-being. We praise you, O oh God, today, tomorrow, forever. Amen and amen. Amen and amen.
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, you adopted us into your family through the waters of holy baptism. In this beautiful area of your country, we are surrounded by water that reminds us of the connection that we have with you. Through our faith in you and the model of your Son, help us to expand our connections with others as we live out our connection with you and others in the beloved community. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 13a. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understood that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this he received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, warned by God about vents as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is his in accordance with faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith, without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, grace, grace and peace to you. There's a sign posted in my friend's garden. Believe, it says. I'm drawn to it, yet there's something strange about that word, standing all by itself, untethered, as if you could separate the act of believing from the object of believing. I mean, believe what? Believe whom? We believe in many different things. Some are merely distractions that our favorite sports team will eventually triumph despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And you know what I'm talking about, Detroit Lions fans. Other things we desperately want to believe, that the pandemic is fading at last and won't cause any more turmoil or grief in our lives. That the brutal destruction of Ukraine will end in a lasting peace, allowing the displaced to rebuild their homes and the nations, their relationships. That our congregations, declining so long, might rediscover and be renewed in faith and mission and thrive once more. But it can be hard to believe the things we most hope for. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, says Hebrews. These things 
hoped for, these things not seen, of which the author speaks, are not generic but particular. They are the promises of God. So beginning with Abel, through the prehistory, and then in the rest of the chapter, starting with Sarah and Abraham, the writer traces the entire history of Israel into the early days of the church, citing example after example of those who heard God's promises, believed, and acted upon them, sometimes under great duress, a roll call of people who trusted in a future shaped by God's promises. We too possess the promises of God. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus said, This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. So we, the broken and the sinful, are brought into God's, Jesus' community of grace and justice. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in this Christ, neither death nor life, not things present nor things to come. How desperately I want to believe this. Yet, as Luther said, we cannot by our own understanding or effort believe in our Lord Jesus or come to him. However, the Holy Spirit has called us through the gospel, enlightened us with his gifts, and sanctified and kept us in the one true faith. We, broken and sinful though we are, have been called and gifted by the Holy Spirit with some measure of faith for the sake of the world. Trembling with fear and at great risk to themselves, our stepmother, Schalke, and her family sheltered their Jewish neighbors during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. For months, they hid their guests under their beds and in their closets, moving them from place to place by stealth of night, believing God's love and justice would eventually triumph. And so, believing God's promises, they became part of God's promises. So also, by faith, Bonhoeffer went to the gallows. By faith, Rosa Parks took her seat. By faith, Desmond Tutu challenged apartheid. By faith, Harry and Dale and Tom and now Catherine have led our synod. In my life, I've watched so many people write their faith stories. Gloria and Bill, Alma and Anna and Irene and Rudy and Ted. Well, you and I are writing our faith stories right now. It has been said, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Each of us singly, all of us together are called by grace into lives of faith so that believing God's promises, we become part of them. Amen. By grace we have been saved, saved by grace through faith. Because of what we do, it is the gift of God. On the days when you are weak, on the days when you are strong, rich or poor, young or old, just listen to the song. By grace we have. Our second reading is from the second chapter of James, verses 13 to 23. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, 
Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. And yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, this is Pastor Bree Kinnanen. I'm the Lutheran campus pastor at Northern Michigan University. In this year of faith, I invite you to listen in on a discussion, a discussion recently had at Common Grounds, a place where we hang out with Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, and have conversations about faith like this. What follows is a discussion about the reading you just heard from James. What is the connection between faith and works? What does it mean to put our faith into action? Let's listen in as we consider these questions and more. While you were reading that, yeah, okay. which is the Good Samaritan, and yeah. that this is no different than what Jesus talked about. I mean, that's the whole thing about the Good Samaritan is Jesus wasn't Jesus always pointing out the folks that had it right religiously, as opposed to the people that actually lived the life of faith. Like mm -hmm. the Good Samaritan came to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, it gets a little wordy the way the scripture is written, <laughs> you know. Just mm -hmm. a tad. Just a tad. So that's what came to my mind. It didn't come to my mind last time when we were talking about this. Huh. I'm highly intrigued by that. Because, yeah, I there's this idea in, in almost pop culture, right? I don't know whether I want to say it that way, but that there's the anger and the misunderstanding of, of other generations and other people in the Catholic faith, especially, that they're... they're concerned about the numbers coming in, right? They don't understand why these young couples are leaving the church and not coming in in mass as their generation may have. But the response is this theme of because we're we're doing what you taught us. We you sent us to catechism. You sent us to do these things. You you made us sit down and read the Bible and we've read and we've studied and we've done all of these things and what we were taught to do you don't. So we left to find those things where they do. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Do you know what it also reminds me of? Just to say to folks who are part of congregations that feel like they're dying, it doesn't mean that you don't have faith. Like your faith is good enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. That reminds me of, because obviously the first time I read through this, I was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> oh geez, have I been doing this totally wrong this whole time? And then my fears were quickly remedied. Um, but something that I noticed in the second letter of James is that there's no metric, right? I think we talked about this at some point. There's no scale where if, because my immediate, my analytical urge is to say, well, how good is good enough? How can I be good enough to make sure that my faith isn't dead? Because that's a very scary sentence. And I realize that we aren't given that in scripture for a reason. Because it's not about, it's not, we don't have a handy dandy chart of like, okay, well, if I'm act, doing this much good in faith, and it reminded me a lot of um, Cindy's story and how we are incredibly limited creatures in terms of how much we can do at any given point in time and where the the invocation of someone who doesn't have food and who doesn't have clothes on their back and how working towards that is good enough and how doing a little bit of good inspired by faith is doing good enough where it's not about it's not about accolade it's not about 
achievement. It's not about being the best. It's about the things that faith absolutely compel us to do. Um, which uh, helped me when I was wrangling with works because I I'm, I I'm like holy cow what is a good work am I doing good works <laughs> this has never really been something that I've I've considered a prominent part of my personal theology like oh my gosh um, and I realized that maybe I was I was I was looking at the wrong objective when I was reading this that I was freaked out about the wrong thing because I don't think there is need for alarm for mm. those of us who whose emphasis is on faith. What were you freaked out about? That I wasn't doing, that I wasn't doing good enough works. My faith wasn't inspiring me to do good enough works. But, but like, <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many faith, like, to, to like, uh, uh, the best example I can think of right now, though, the, the, I'm sure there are plenty more, right? Like, our works don't happen in a church. Mm. And, and, like, works don't happen after a prayer or, or, during a service of some kind. They can. Mm-hmm. They absolutely do, but they don't exclusively, right? Like, like it, my faith can absolutely be shown through me pulling over the side of the road and, and helping somebody who's stuck or, 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 you know, shoveling somebody else's driveway at my next door or whatever else. But, like, those aren't things that we, I think, automatically consider works I, i'm gonna go so, do a good work right and so that right there shows right like they, they can't they're not all this one big thing that works all together in this jumble universe of spider web perfection it's on a snowflake that made this wonderful web that works right it, it's it's I, I don't know i'm i'm thinking of maybe a more productive way to frame the thoughts i was having it made me check my privilege does that make sense where it made me realize that like, and it kind of what you're saying where it's not about checking a box. It's not about the things that, I mean, they certainly can happen on Sundays, but how that's, that maybe we have our priorities wrong. By grace we have been saved, saved by grace through faith. Not because of what we do, it is a gift of God. Rest your body, rest your mind. In the stillness you will find. You're a lovely, precious child. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And, leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. What are you afraid of? During these past two years of disruption, we have had new things to be afraid of. Fear that our relationships won't handle the stress of disagreements. Grief that presents as fear and anger that too much is changing too fast fear of loss, afraid that sure, the church will survive this, but will my church? 
afraid that people won't come back, afraid of illness, giving it or getting it, fear of death. The disciples in our gospel reading are certainly afraid of death. The storm that tosses the disciples' boat on the waves must really have been something to rattle these seasoned fishermen. The waves loom large, the wind blows hard, the little boat is at the mercy of the storm, and the disciples are afraid that they're all going to die. They cry out to Jesus, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Or in other words, wake up, Jesus. You should at least be awake when we're all going to die. And how can this not matter to you? The disciples are afraid of the storm, afraid for their lives. And more than that, they are afraid that Jesus doesn't care and that he is oblivious to their situation. They fear the indifference of their teacher because it's not as if they wake up Jesus so he can help them. There is no indication that they expect Jesus to do anything except join their anxiety, cling to that rocking boat and perish with them. It seems as if they have no idea who it is who is traveling with them. They have no idea who it is that naps in their boat, who it is that teaches them and leads them and calls them to follow. What they know in this moment is fear. Their full attention is captured by the storm and that they are perishing. And their only other thought is that Jesus should care. So they wake Jesus up and Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves as if they are some noisy, naughty child. Peace, be still. And the gospel of Mark tells us that the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. It's like the shut off button to the Whirlpool hot tub has been pushed. Everything is turned off. In a moment, the gusting wind stops blowing, the seas stop churning and the foaming roiling water becomes smooth as glass without a ripple on the surface or even a whisper of wind. In one moment, the disciples and their boat are sinking into a turbulent sea and in the next, they are floating quietly on a dead calm. And in that stillness, in that quiet, the disciples feel their fear rise and terror fills them for a completely new reason. Who is this, they ask, that even the wind and the sea obey him? During the storm, they feared the absence, the indifference of Jesus, but now, now they fear the terrifying nearness of the divine, that the very God who created the heavens and the earth is sitting next to them on a cushion in their little boat. For they know that only God has power over the wind and the waves. The disciples look at Jesus with great awe and fear and into the spine tingling quiet of the still storm. They realize that the power and the presence of God is disturbingly near in Jesus. In this year of faith, I invite you to get to know Jesus better than the disciples did in this moment. I urge you to do what you can to know who it is who sits with you, who travels with you, who challenges you, who leads you and calls you to follow, and who asks you about your fear and your faith. As people of faith, we proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God and his Holy Spirit is the very presence of God in our midst. And yet it seems we might well prefer to keep God at a manageable distance. We are perhaps uncomfortable with God's transforming power, even as we join our voices to those of the disciples in the boat, wanting to wake God up with, do you not care that we are perishing? And yet, 
God has been with us all along. Not just to sit in your boat and weather your storms, but to transform you into a disciple who knows and believes who Jesus is and to make you into a disciple that is not afraid either of the nearness of God, nor of the winds that blow, nor of giving witness to a hope for a world that might be too consumed with their own fears to listen. The very God who created the heavens and the earth, who raised Jesus from the dead, is indeed near to you. In this year of faith, I urge you to get to know God in Christ Jesus more deeply, more fully, more completely, even as you are already deeply, fully, and completely known and loved by the God who not only made the heavens and the earth, but also made you. We thank God for the gift of faith, for that spirit that calls us to seek God's face, and for the relationship to the divine that God offers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. By grace we have been saved, saved by grace through faith, not because of what we do, it is the gift of God. You don't need to be afraid. church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In Christ Jesus, we meet the God who knows our weaknesses and bears the wounds of the world. Therefore, let us be bold as we pray, trusting that God draws near to those in any kind of need. God of leadership and direction, we pray for your Holy Spirit to give wisdom and knowledge to our governmental leaders. There is so much to manage, and there is less working together for the care and support of all. Give us the ability to see that when we need to speak to our leaders with your direction, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of vision, our churches are changing before our eyes. Be with our bishops, rostered leaders, and those whom you raise up within our churches as we try and navigate your new direction for your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, you have created each one of us uniquely and that creates so much richness in our beloved community. But we know that the diversity that you have created can cause anxiety. Give us the love that we need to accept all people as you have created them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, thank you for the beauty of creation that surrounds us. Give us your wisdom and knowledge to care for this gift that you have so freely given us to steward and protect. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, 
You have called our Synod to be your beloved community in this region of your creation. Continue to help us to see that your will is for the work that you call us to do. Teach us to reach out in love. Give us what we need to shine with your light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, there are many in our congregations who have suffered illness and loss. You know each one. Give us the grace to reach out to them with care and compassion so they may know your love for them. We invite your prayers spoken aloud or held in your heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of stamina and courage, as we continue to live for you, give us strength, humbleness, and faith in you to keep running the race that you have set before us. May we proclaim your gospel boldly in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your wide embrace, O God, we place all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting that you will receive them into your heart of mercy, even as we pray in the way our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. God's peace. God's peace. Peace be with you. The peace of the Lord. Peace be with you. God's peace. We hope you've been enjoying this Synod Assembly opening worship service as we have been worshiping under the theme of faith. It's now that time of the worship service when we make note of an offering opportunity. Our Synod Assembly offering for this worship service this year is designated for seminary and scholarships and clergy debt relief. So your generosity in supporting these two efforts under the theme of Answer the Call, are greatly appreciated, and any gifts will be split equally among these two causes, seminarian scholarships and clergy debt relief. Our current seminarians are Pat Kempf, Lance and Wade Crevier, Melissa Salmanen, Jen Elsenbrook, Crystal Maraska, and Lon Heider. We, we see here some testimonials from various people, both in, in seminary and current pastors, if they, as they have appreciated the generosity of people from the Northern Great Lake Synod in, in supporting their efforts to answer the call. And now we'll hear a brief testimonial from Pastor Tim and Kari Vedas of Trinity Lutheran of Rhinelander. Hi, I'm Pastor Kari Vedas. And I'm Pastor Tim Vedas, and we serve together at Trinity Lutheran in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. When we started our first call, we noticed immediately that we couldn't make our seminary student loan payments. And so we decided to refinance them from a 15-year loan to a 30-year loan. So what that means for us is that we will be paying our seminary student debt for virtually our entire ministry. We are grateful to the Northern Great Lakes Synod uh, for the Seminary Student Debt Relief Endowment Fund and the support that that offers us. It not only helps us pay down our principal, but it also is helping us to shorten the length of our student loans. Uh, We appreciate those who had the foresight to set up that uh, endowment fund, and we also appreciate very much those 
who help to support and contribute to that fund. It has a big impact on our ministry and we know it also helps to support pastors throughout our synod. Your generosity means a lot to us and it also means a lot to future leaders in the church. So thank you. Thank you. So we ask you to consider making an offering as part of this Synod Assembly opening worship. Donations will be split equally between seminarian scholarships and the Clergy Debt Relief Fund. You can donate and mail your check to the address that you see on the screen. You can also donate online from our website or use the QR code that you see on the screen. When prompted, designate your gift toward Synod Assembly Opening Worship Offering. We thank you for your tangible financial support of our seminarians and pastors. Receive the blessing. Christ Jesus, dwell in our hearts through faith, as we are being rooted and grounded in love, strengthened by the Spirit, and filled with all the fullness of God. And the Holy Three, the Holy One, increase your hope, strengthen your faith, deepen your love, and grant you peace. Amen. Go in peace. The Christ, the Spirit of the living God, is with you. 
Thanks be to God.